Lecture 12, Gilgamesh and History. Gilgamesh is a great book. We have defined a great book as a work with a great theme, written in noble language, speaks across the ages, and I believe should speak to you as an individual. Now Gilgamesh has a great theme. It is the very meaning of life. Why are we here? And it is written, written in noble language. It was originally composed in the Sumerian language, a language that we really don't know the origins of. And it was a Sumerian story about a Sumerian city, Uruk. But the Akkadians, a Semitic people with a Semitic language, living close to and ultimately conquering the Sumerians, found it so absorbing that they, that they translated it. It was then translated into Babylonian and Assyrian and spoke all the way from perhaps its original composition around 2200 BC, then put into poetic form around 1100, and 400 years later the king of Assyria would read it. It also served as a school text, and generation after generation of bureaucrats in the cities and empires of the Middle East, learn their letters by copying the Gilgamesh. When it was rediscovered in the 19th century, it created a sensation. And on into the 21st century, poets and ordinary people are moved by it. So it was written in noble language. It speaks across the ages. And I am always very surprised when my classes of senior citizens and my undergraduates respond so enthusiastically to a good, coherent translation of the Gilgamesh. So it is a great book. It is worthy to rank, I believe, with the Iliad and the Odyssey, with the Aeneid. It is worthy to rank with the magnificent epics of Indian poetry. It also has a historical kernel. Gilgamesh was a real king of Uruk. We have inscriptions by him documenting his building of temples and the walls of Uruk, dated to around 2700 BC. But the story also shows how history gets transformed into myth. And Gilgamesh was such, such an overwhelming figure to the imagination of the storytellers of Mesopotamia that more and more other stories were added to him. Humbaba, that sounds wonderful. How about we add the bull of heaven? How about we add the search for eternal life? This flood story, it needs a central figure. And so the legend grows, and myth is grow, it develops flowers really out of a historical kernel, in this case of Gilgamesh. But there is an even more significant historical kernel because Gilgamesh presents us with the beginning of civilization, and it is the epic of the beginning of civilization. What do I mean by the beginning of civilization? Sometime around 8,000 BC, humans began to settle down, build even small villages, and above all, cultivate crops and domesticate animals. This is a constantly shifting field as new techniques are brought to bear upon the evidence and more archaeological sites discovered, the questions remain, what was the actual date of this revolution in which agriculture began? Where did it begin? Was it the result of influence traveling along, or was it spontaneous and 
several different areas. But by 3000 BC, another revolution occurred, and that's the beginning of civilized life. And it occurred without doubt, first in Mesopotamia and Egypt, well before it occurred in the other classical civilizations such as China and India. Around 3000 BC, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, the land of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, what we would call Iraq today, with mutual influence, writing was invented, monumental architecture took place, made possible by the transition from an age of stone to an age of bronze, the ability to make bronze and to forge tools out of it, and complex government structures. In Egypt, the birth of civilization was marked by the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, the two lands. And we know the specific figure who achieved it, Narmer. And he has left behind our earliest historical document of his conquest of Egypt, uniting the two lands by force, the Scorpion King and the bodies of the slain, their heads cut off, poles carried with their heads on them to signify his conquest and unification of all of Egypt, knotting the lands together, the capital of Memphis. And from that time onward, all through antiquity, Egypt would be ruled as one land with a pharaoh, a God on earth, conceived by the gods, the son of the great god Amun-Ra. And the ordinary address to the Pharaoh was the good god. In Mesopotamia, a different form of political entity arose. Individual cities such as Ur, Uruk, Kish, and the invention of writing, the development of bronze tools, monumental architecture, and complex government structures occurred first among the Sumerians. They called themselves the black-haired people. They preserved a tradition that they had come from India by sea, but they settled there in the lower part of the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. Their political system was different too, in the sense that they had a king, but the king was not a god. He might be semi-divine the way Gilgamesh was, but he was appointed by the god to rule over the city. And although there were many different gods, each city tended to have a special patron divinity. Now why this sudden burst of civilization in these two areas? I'm going to suggest to you that it was a result of climactic change. On the whole, I'm not a fan of climactic changes as explanations in history, but I think a great dry period struck both Egypt and Mesopotamia, followed by incessant flooding. And so the river, the Tigris and the Euphrates and the Nile, was a foe, an enemy. And it could only be made into a friend by complex hydraulic engineering, by which the water of the Nile could be made to flow on a regular basis and by channels brought in and irrigate the land, expanding the amount of land that could be cultivated. And in the same way in Mesopotamia, the rivers had to be tamed and channeled. And once that was done, a regular crop could be produced, people could buy food in the market, thus enabling them not to be farmers, but to work in other crafts, such as making tools, such as building the great temples of the cities of Mesopotamia, like the temple in Uruk to Ishtar that Gilgamesh is so proud of. Or later on, 
the pyramids. To do this, however, required a strong centralized government. And at this critical moment, and I think it happened very quickly, at this critical moment around 3000 BC, in both Mesopotamia and in Egypt, people decided that they needed a strong government. That alone could mobilize the manpower, put in place the hydraulic engineering, and enable them to survive and flourish. They chose strong, authoritarian, centralized rule. And both the first pharaohs of Egypt and kings like Gilgamesh were, in modern terms, progressive, with a capital P. They believed, as Abraham Lincoln said, that the government should do for the individual what the individual cannot do for himself or do as well. And the individual citizens of Uruk could not get themselves together and democratically decide to raise the taxes and money to have this hydraulic engineering. Thus, they accepted a strong centralized government and with it taxes. And taxes are not only always with us, but they are part of the birth of civilization. I am quite convinced that writing was invented both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia very rapidly as soon as there were strong rulers like the Scorpion King or like the ancestors of Gilgamesh who needed a way of keeping a tally on the taxes that were brought in so they could have a budget so they could be, could be sure that everybody had paid their taxes and that there was enough left over for them to live well. Because as soon as we began to see the temples rising in Mesopotamia, as soon as the lands of Egypt are united, conspicuous consumption, first among the king and then by his closest advisors and the priests, conspicuous consumption begins. I would not be surprised if one day Pharaoh, the scorpion king, came into his council chamber, called his advisors around and said, how do we know that every gnome, every division, every state of Egypt is paying its share, fair amount of taxes? Well, uh, I want a system to record these taxes and I want it by the end of business at the end of this week, and they did it. So writing grew up out of the necessity of supporting these strong rulers and this need to have taxes, and centralized government. And then, well, the conspicuous consumption. That wasn't for Pharaoh himself, he would have told you, nor was it for Gilgamesh. It was, and there was a great deal of truth in this. It was an entitlement to the people because both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, there were periods when uh, the agriculture could not be carried out during the year. So how were people to live? Thus, these great enterprises like the pyramids, like the temples, like the walls, were undertaken in order to give jobs to the, the inhabitants, the subjects of the king and Pharaoh. Thus, the great pyramids dating to around 2500 BC, they may be the most magnificent and enduring example, one, of what a central government can do, two, how to take care of its people, because we have records of what the builders of the pyramids ate, what they drank, what their work hours were, and they were in no sense slaves. They were ordinary subjects of the Pharaoh, glad to get the work. But also, it was a means of making Pharaoh immortal. For unlike poor Gilgamesh, the Pharaohs of Egypt, starting well before Cheops, built these pyramids as their stepping stone up into heaven, where they became immortal and lived forever forever 
as the stars. So conspicuous consumption is also part of the beginning of civilization. But there was a fundamental element in both Egypt and in Mesopotamia that was lacking and would not be discovered until the genius of the Greeks. And that was the idea of freedom. No one except Pharaoh, no one except the great king in Egypt or in Sumer was free. The Egyptian language, this magnificent civilization that built the pyramids, did not even have a word in its language for freedom. Sumerian and Akkadian did have a cuneiform uh, symbol that stood for freedom, but it really is to be translated as liberties. That is to say, liberties that the king gives you, such as perhaps not having to pay taxes this year because there's a drought, but which he can take away whenever he wants. So no one is free but the king. Secondly, the beginning of civilization also marked the first attempt to build empires. Egypt itself came into being as a civilized society with the empire of the whole Nile. And from the earliest days of the cities in Sumer, there was a constant attempt to expand. And by the year roughly 2200 BC, the first true superpower had been created, Sargon, the ruler of Akkad. Now, the Sumerians spoke their distinctive language. The Akkadians were Semitic. And gradually, the Akkadians conquered Sumer, and under Sargon, an empire was established that reached far across the Middle East, perhaps as far as to the Mediterranean Sea, up into what we would call Turkey, and into what we would call Iran today. And Sargon conceived of himself as the first great conqueror to rule over a multi-ethnic empire and to have duties to his subjects, to allow them to preserve their customs, but at the same time, demanding their absolute loyalty. And his birth story is fascinating. He, the biography that has come down to us describes how his mother was a priestess and he was, and he was conceived in secret and she put him in a basket, made it, sealed it with pitch and put it into the river. And he floated down and was found by a water drawer, a gardener, who served one of the high officials of the king. And he would ultimately come to the attention of the king and, and, and in a path so often known to us from this course, murdered his benefactor and became king himself. The Middle East provides us with an eternal lesson that is as valid today as it was in the third millennium BC. Freedom is not a universal value. And we start with the very definition of freedom. The word we use as freedom, in fact, if we will think about it carefully, consists of three separate components. National freedom, political freedom, and individual freedom. National freedom is freedom from foreign domination. It is your right as an Egyptian not to be ruled over by the barbarous Babylonians. It is your right as a member of a tribe 
not to be ruled over by another tribe. And that national freedom, that hatred of foreign domination, that is perhaps the most basic and universal idea of freedom. The second is political freedom. And political freedom is your right to vote, to hold office, serve on juries, all of those political freedoms that we so often take for granted. That is much rarer. Democracies are few and fragile as we go through history. Monarchy, as in Egypt, as in Mesopotamia, as in the Middle Ages, as right down until the time of the American Revolution, one strong man rule has always been the basic human desire. Interesting that in ancient Sumerian, the word for the king is just lugal. That means the boss. Political freedom, very rare. And then third, individual freedom. The freedom to live as you choose as long as you harm no one else. And to have that freedom guaranteed. That is almost as rare as political freedom. These three components, national freedom, political freedom, individual freedom, they are not mutually, essentially inclusive. You can have national freedom without political freedom and without individual freedom. Uh, what's an example for today? North Korea, national freedom, no political freedom, and no individual freedom whatsoever. You can have political freedom and individual freedom without national freedom. Japan and Germany never really had political freedom nor real individual freedom until they had lost their national freedom by being conquered by the United States. And you can have political freedom, national freedom, without individual freedom. Ancient Sparta. No one was more fiercely independent than the Spartans. No one had more democracy than the Spartans. But you were most certainly not free to live the way you chose. You chose the Spartan way of life. Now, why do I talk about this as we discuss the beginning of civilization? Because we have followed in the footsteps of so many empires that have come before us. We have called, in this course, the Middle East the crucible of conflict and the graveyard of empires. Where is the empire of Sargon? It passed away and his city, his nation of the Akkadians, was conquered by the Babylonians. Hammurabi, issued the first great law code, and Hammurabi's name would ring through history. But where are the Babylonians today? Where is their language? Where are their gods? Cyrus the Great would unite all of the Persian Empire, all the way from Pakistan to the Danube River, and his power extending all the way across North Africa. One Pan Near Eastern superpower. And yet, where's the empire of Cyrus? Defeated by the Greeks at Marathon, at Salamis, and then Persia conquered by Alexander the Great. Where are the empires of the Islamic Middle Ages? So the empires come and go. And the Middle East has seen the Crusaders come and attempt to impose upon them Western values, Christianity. And I believe many of the Crusaders came for very gallant purposes, as they saw it, to save the Muslims from hell, to bring them this Western and only faith of Christianity. The Crusaders erected kingdoms in the Middle East. They've all passed away. A few sad and lonely castles, like the Croc de Chevalier, stand as silent testimony to the failure to impose Western values.
Napoleon came, bringing the ideal of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Why, the modern study of Egypt begins with Napoleon's expedition. And he failed. He passed away, as all conquerors do, barely spending a year in Egypt before he fled back to France. And it was though he had never been there, except maybe some of his soldiers fired their cannons and knocked off the nose of the Sphinx. In fact, the Sphinx is a very, very rich symbol of the Middle East. We don't know what it stands for. We don't know who erected it. It sits there timeless, staring at all those who come to reform the Middle East. The British came. Camel Corps of, Camel Corps of um, Lawrence of Arabia. For more than 50 years, they sought to bring democratic government to the Middle East. The French came after World War I again. They had Syria as a mandate from the League of Nations. They wrote constitutions. They held elections. Parliamentary governments were formed all over Syria and Iraq and in Egypt. And they had absolutely no success whatsoever. And finally, the French would fail in Syria. They would put down a revolt in Aleppo. One would break out in Damascus. And all it did was so weaken the French will that in 1940, it played a key role in the collapse of France, their failure in their mandate of Syria. And after World War II, the British simply scuttled out of the Middle East, turning it over to us. We recognize the state of Israel, and Israel is a democracy, the only working democracy in the Middle East. But it doesn't come with Middle Eastern values. It comes with the values of Europe. So we have stepped into the place of so many who have come before us. And we too have a religion like the Crusaders. It's democracy. And it's our form of democracy. You see, we in the United States and the ancient Athenians of the fifth century, we have most perfectly combined national freedom, political freedom, individual freedom. We are so free as a nation that we cannot imagine being conquered. I never get upset when people don't vote. That shows how much we take our political freedoms for granted. We don't need a dictator to make us turn out so there's a 98% vote. We have political freedom. We exercise it every day. And nowhere in the world are you more free than in the United States free to live as you choose. Are people by the millions swimming across the Black Sea to migrate to the Ukraine? No, but they come here in the millions every year to the United States to live a better life. So our lesson from the ancient Middle East is a cautionary tale. The Middle East will always choose a Gilgamesh. And if the Gilgamesh proves to be too corrupt, too abusive, too greedy, then there'll be riots in the streets, just as we saw in the Gilgamesh. And the population will want to pull him down. But whatever slogans they might give out, such as today we want democracy, that is not what will happen? Gilgamesh, if he fails, will be replaced by another strong man. An Enkidu will be brought in. And in the case of the Gilgamesh, they made friends and went off on a quest. But the strong man is what the Middle East wants. So let us perhaps step back, learn from history, and learn that perhaps one of the myths, with no historical kernel to it whatsoever,
is that freedom is a universal value. That it is, as President Bush said in his second inaugural, the universal longing of the human soul. No, the universal longing of the human soul is security, plenty to eat, and the absence of the responsibility of self-government.